right. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath set, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance to our, of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise, and the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteous, be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Let's uh, open in prayer. Holy Father, Lord, we thank you again, Lord, for the time we can come together. Lord, I pray you bless this uh, message, Lord, tonight. Lord, thank you for your word, and Lord, I thank you for the time we can, can get around it and open it. Lord, pray that we get encouragement from it. Lord, I pray that this message would be helpful to, to us, Lord, helpful to those that are listening. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I've had a few opportunities, pastors given me to, to preach, to kind of fill in for him, and I, 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 I thank him for that. It's, it's a, a privilege to do it. I consider it an honor, and... Um, there's been a couple times I've gone to prepare messages, and this, is, this passage of Scripture is one that always comes to my mind, and I've always kind of shifted from it and done something else. But God brought this back to my memory, and uh, I wanted to preach on, on this passage. And I, growing up, I, I was a privilege of growing up in a Christian school, and we'd always would sing praise and worship songs for openings. And one of the songs we would always sing is Beauty for Ashes. I don't know, have you ever, who's heard that song before? It's, it's, it was popular for a while, and... I, I don't know, I guess maybe, I would say maybe it's contemporary in that it was written of, you know, a modern day, but it's, I guess the music was written, but this passage is actually right out of Isaiah uh, chapter 61 here. And there's, that song, the tune has always kind of stuck with me, we sang it often, and I just kind of want to dig into it a little bit tonight, uh, what this passage is saying and talking about. Um, there's a lot of calamity and things that are going on in, in the world, as you all know, and we're all part of and see. Um, I think a lot of times we get distracted, um, we get um, consumed with what's going on around us, and uh, I just really wanted to, to point out some, some things in this, in this passage tonight. Um, you know, we talk about people are, who are in calamity, um, a crisis, or mourning, or trouble, hard times, difficult situations, and those aren't just people that are unsaved. That's, I've seen it, you know, in, in my own family, quite honestly, and, and close friends and family that are Christians, they, they have sometimes that, those, those characteristics or those things that come upon them. Um, but God has given us um, tools in his word that we can overcome those things. And I want to talk about some of that tonight. Um, and really specifically, difficult circumstances. Um, you know, difficult circumstances, I believe God uses them. You know, sometimes we can think, well, why is this happening to me? Why am I going through these difficult times? I believe God does bring things like that upon it to us, and he's got a purpose. He's got a greater good. Um, and I think oftentimes he does it to get our attention. You know, you think about our sin nature. Um, you know, if you're saved here tonight, obviously God had, has brought that sin before you at one point. You came to understand that you were a sinner. You came to the point of knowing that you needed a savior. Um, you were came to a point where you, you re, were broken, I guess, per se, and uh, you knew that you needed to repent. And God will get our attention and bring us to points. And even as a Christian, God will get our attention to bring us to points. And um, if there's anybody that needs to get our attention, that would be God, right? And I, oftentimes when God gets our attention, then we know that he has our attention as well, right? Or we, we have his attention. God is always listening. He's always willing to... to to come to us. We want God's eyes upon us. You know, I think of the, the passage that talks about God's eyes on the sparrow. He cares, he watches, he sees all things. I want God to, to hear my, my cry and when my difficult time is. But, you know, like I said, God will bring those difficulties upon us and to us, often to get our attention, to humble us. And um, he desires that we, we have our, our heart in tune with him. He wants us to have um, our attention on him. And the Bible says here that the Bible says that he, um, 
he will give us beauty for ashes. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, in the times of the Bible, it was a custom, you know, uh, we read about how people, when they were in great mourning, oftentimes they said they, they put sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes on, and it was kind of a demonstration of their outward, outwardly what they were feeling inwardly, right? The Bible says here in Isaiah um, chapter 61 that God will give us beauty for ashes. So I want to kind of think about that tonight. Uh, and focus on that. Um, if you've got a problem in your life, um, oftentimes I think we kind of just want to sit down in a pile of ashes, right? And we dwell on it. We kind of wallow in it. Um, but God wants us to know that we can give it to him and turn those, beauty, that be, or turn those ashes into beauty. You know, we think about ashes. There's really not anything beautiful about ashes, is there? You know, it's dirty. It's, I remember when I was younger, or even now, or whenever, when we have a fire or fire pit, and there's ashes left. You got to clean it up, and then it tends to get everywhere. It gets all over. So there's really nothing beautiful about ashes. Um, the scripture says that he's going to take our difficult things, uh, our disgusting things, our depressing and horrible situation, and, and turn it into beauty for us. And he does that. God does that. He's going to pick us up out of the ash pile and make something beautiful out of us. Um, and it's amazing. And uh, pastors preached about this. I've heard many people preach about it before. That it's amazing when you can see the transformation that a, that a person has from, from being unsaved to saved. And the world looks at that, and they can't comprehend it. Because, you know, there's so many self-help things out there that we can go to and, you know, um, programs. And there maybe there's some level of success people can have with those things. But to see a total transformation of someone's life that is completely ruined and wrecked to one of beauty, only Jesus Christ can do that. Excuse me. Uh, something else that gets my attention, um, the God's word. God often needs to get our attention, and we need to see our true reflection. Um, you know, his mirror, which is God's word, the mirror of his word, is just, it's, it's spot-on accurate. We can go to it, it's truth, it's, it's, it's error-free. Um, you know, you think of um, a, a mirror or a reflection or even with, when you think of a diamond, you know, they, they grade a diamond based upon its perfection or there's no impurities in it. There is no impurities in God's word. And we can go to it and read it and study it, and it's perfect. It's spot on accurate. It's precise. And what we can do and what God does is he shows us our own life in, rela in relation in light of his word. It's a mirror that's not distorted. It's not warped. It, what it does is it magnifies and it shows the truth about our situation and where we're at in life. And I praise God for that. In John 17, verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Going back to Isaiah, he says he will give us beauty for ashes. God knew that we would be burnt by life's situation experiences oftentimes. But he also knew that he could replace that burned out mess with something beautiful. And I'm so glad that way back in the Garden of Eden, God knew and predestined, he knew that man would fall, but yet he gave us a free will to choose. And even though God knew we would sin, he knew that he could transform that life and bring back redemption through his son, Jesus Christ, in his shed blood. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. He has made beautiful everything beautiful in his, time, in his time. You know, I think of different applications that you can look to and think about in the Bible. One of the first ones I think about is found in Job, um, chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, I'll read here. And it says, And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And, I am, and only I am escaped to tell thee. Then Job arose, and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped. You know, for many of us, I believe, or probably most of us, are familiar with the story of Job, and what transpired in his life, and how God allowed that really to have an illustration and prove a point to Satan. And, uh, you know, it's amazing to think that what God, what God did through that situation and how Job even endured through that, through God's strength. 
But one thing I want to point out is at the end of it said, it said, Job arose, he rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell upon the ground and worshipped. <clears throat> so we know that Job's situation in his life, it was burnt, right? By all, intense, by, by all standards, what happened to him was terrible. It was absolutely terrible what happened to him. But what Job did is he recognized his position, he took humility, and, you know, and he gave the illustration, you have the illustration here, what they did in those times, he, he rent his mantle, he shaved his head, and he fell down upon the ground. It, it illustrated his humility, and what did he do? He worshipped. He worshipped. And that worship, that praise, what it did is it caused Satan to flee. So God allowed that situation where Job's life was burnt, burnt by the devil, and what Satan desired to do to him, he fell down and worshipped, and because of that, Satan fleed, and God was praised, and God was glorified. <coughs> Excuse me. Another illustration I want to talk about or recognize tonight is Daniel chapter 6, verses 10. It says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened into the chamber toward Jerusalem, he knelt upon his knees three times a day and prayed, and gave thanks before his God, as he did aforetime. And another illustration that probably many of us are familiar with, um, Daniel in the lion's den. We know what happened there where um, the king made a decree that he wasn't supposed to pray to anybody but the king. And Daniel refused to do that. He knew there was only one true God, and he continued to pray. And obviously we know the story that Daniel was set up you know, by uh, other people that were trying to dispose of him. But Daniel chose to, to be truthful and faithful to God, and he prayed. We know that Daniel was in the lion's dens, and he prayed and he gave thanks. And we know the end of the story, that God delivered him. And that is another illustration that we can recognize, that there was a difficult time, a, really a depressing time for Daniel. Um, you know, by world standards, he's going to go, he's going to die. He's going to get thrown to the lion's den. But Daniel chose to pray and be thankful to God, and God turned that into a beautiful situation where God was glorified. Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. And Abraham said unto the young men, Abide here with the ass, and, I will, and the lad will go up yonder and worship and come again unto you. Another story we're probably all familiar with, where God told Abraham to sacrifice his only son, which was an illustration of God and sacrificing his only son. Um, and what did Abraham do? He worshipped. He praised. And what was, what was the result? God was glorified. And God, and, and God was honored through that. And all these situations that I'm talking about, they were, these were situations that were, we would think were terrible. They were disastrous. But God turned them into good. And the result, or the the, for, the forerunner of those things were, was, was thankfulness and praise. Abraham sacrificed his son. He said, I'm the lad, will go to worship. We'll go and worship. And we know the end result. He didn't really sacrifice his son. God stopped him. And, uh, and God worked about a miracle through that. 1 Samuel 2, verse 1, it says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. This scripture verse is talking about after we know the story of Hannah, how she was barren. She prayed for a son, and God, God granted that. And this verse is after where she, she came and brought Samuel to, 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 be a, to minister uh, in the temple. And uh, rather than being sorrowful, she remembered the... She remembered the vow that she vowed to God, and she instead she praised God and thanked him for that. And we know the end, end result. God brought her many more children, and we know the great prophet and what God used and how he was glorified through Samuel's life. <clears throat> Another illustration, uh, Philippians 4, verse 4. It says, Rejoice always in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. And this is uh, penned by the great apostle Paul. And uh, quite possibly he was in prison many times. So we know about Paul, Paul and Silas was in, were in jail. And what did they do? They sang and they, they praised God. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Oil of joy for mourning. Oil was often used and applied to, to, the, to the face. Um, and it created a shine. Um, instead of mourning, which disfigures the face, um, that's what's speaking of oil, how um, it, can, it, it represents that. 
in our lives, that oil is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Um, it's like a, a living well of water, and it's, it's a daily thing that we choose to do, whether we want to walk with the Lord. As a Christian, um, it's still, it, salvation is a one-time thing, but our decision to walk in the Spirit is daily. It's continuing. It's actually all day. You know, it talks about uh, pray without ceasing. We have to keep that relationship constantly throughout the day. A joy unspeakable and full of glory. Even in the hard times, we, have to, we, we should and have, should have that joy. Uh, it speaks of the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Um, two, two, two things that God, that God will replace and give us instead. <clears throat> this heaviness talks about our inner hurts, uh, our depression, despair, de- dejection, hopelessness, uh, broken heart, broken heartedness. Um, quite honestly, some people suicidal tendencies, self-pity, uh, excessive mourning. Uh, maybe you have this one, insomnia, have a hard time sleeping, sorrow or grief. The root of this heaviness or spirit can at times come from one thing, possibly. And it may not, there might be other things, but in this context, it comes from a lack of praise and thankfulness. Often um, bitterness can give us that, that, that feeling, um, the lack of thankfulness and praise, uh, being unthankful. The spirit of heaviness will attempt to steal your joy. And, and that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to rob us of our joy. Uh, without joy, we have a tendency to move to self-pity. Psalm, <clears throat> excuse me, Psalm 69, verse 20 says, Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, I found none. <clears throat> the devil wants us to feel sorry for ourselves. He wants us to feel alone and depressed. But we should not let him do that. It's, it's, it's wrong for us to do that. It's, it's sin for us to do that. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Isaiah 43, 1 through 7. <clears throat> but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he hath formed thee. O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, thou shalt not overflow thee. They shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, they shall not be burned. Thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for, men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. This is talking about God and his concern for you and his concern and care for me. Depression often afflicts uh, Christians, and I feel like get so wrapped up into it that it will... Satan desires to make them useless for, for God's glory and useless for the cause of Christ. And I think that often happens when we start to get overwhelmed and wrapped up in our day-to-day lives. Um, you know that a verse that talks about, let me get back and find it here at the beginning. The garment of praise. Um, the definition of this garment in the Hebrew, I kind of looked at it and did a little bit of a definition search. It, it speaks about a, a clothing article that wraps around us. Um, just like we can get our lives so wrapped up in our day-to-day, day-to-day occurrences that we can be overwhelmed with things and really not focus on our walk with the Lord like we ought to. And that will turn into neglect of God's word. And it will turn into depression. It will turn into those, those heavy feelings uh, that the, the Bible talks about, the heaviness. They feel, uh, we feel the weight of, of things, of serving God, rather than the joy that we ought to be feeling of serving God. Um, you know, we're left with dull mechanisms, dull, dull mechanics. We just go through the routine. 
And we ought not be that way. We ought to wrap ourselves in joy and praising and thankfulness. And God will turn that into to strength. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. If we wrap ourselves in God's word, we wrap ourselves in, God, in the praise and thankfulness that, that we should have, God will give us that joy. And our serving won't turn into dull mechanisms or dull mechanic. It will be something that that overflows, and we'll get that strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. <clears throat> you know, we read about King Saul, who was afflicted by depression, and he called for David to play and sing the anointed. <clears throat> you know, I think there's so many times, uh, there is illustrations in the Bible, how powerful music and praising is. And, uh, you know, I, um, I can think of times when I was younger and... Uh, I was I had the privilege of being in, in different churches growing up, and there there's a different there's a different taste or flair of music in every church that I've been a part of, and uh, and I don't mean just the style of music. I'm talking about um, the heart, the heart being in it. And that's something I really desire that our church has. You know, we we do sing um, the the classic hymns here, and I I, I love those, and I'm glad we do. Uh, but just because they may be, in our in world standards, um, traditional, doesn't mean we should not sing them from the heart. We should, we should sing out. Um, sometimes I look around and I see people just kind of, you know, we ought to really sing for the Lord, sing to the Lord, and, and have him give us that, that thankfulness, sing, sing the worship, sing that praise. And I believe it, what it does is it aligns our heart and it prepares our heart for for the worship of the preaching and the worship of the service. <clears throat> and that's God's desire, I believe. Uh, Isaiah 59, verse 19 says, So shall thy fear, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in, like, in a like flood, the spirit of the Lord shall be a standard against him. You know, God gives us the ability to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Resist that, that temptation. Resist the depression that often will come upon us. <clears throat> and again, we do that by wrapping ourselves in praise. Romans 6, 16 says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servant to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. <clears throat> Don't give in to the spirit of heaviness. Use God's word like a sword. You know, I talked about that mirror. We need to go to it daily, routinely, to see the true image, the true reflection of ourselves and get that guidance from God's word so we can walk in the spirit. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 1, 1 through 11. This is a larger passage, but I, I, I'd like to read it here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of, of God, which is in Corinth, with all the saints, which are in all Achaia, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us with in all our tribulation, and we, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. <clears throat> be by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as of the sufferings of Christ are bound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope, is, our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have ye be ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, ab above strength, inasmuch that we despaired even of life, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raised the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means 
of many persons, thanks be given by many on our behalf. You know, we can see, we read here about the trouble and the, and the, the tri tribulation that Paul went through. <clears throat> and through it all, he could give God, God glory and praise and give thanks. And we know that God used that. It used, he used it mightily. <clears throat> and that's no, no different than our, in our lives today. There's, there's nothing different about the Christians of the Bible that we read about that God will not and, and won't do for us. <clears throat> James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The praise of God's people silences the devil. <clears throat> Psalm 8, verses 1 through 2. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glories above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy still the enemy and the avenger. Praise is the, uh, praise is the garment of the spirit. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. We must literally clothe ourselves in praise. We must put it on. <clears throat> Every morning we need to decide what to wear. You know, we go into the wardrobe, if you have a wardrobe and you decide what to wear. Well, the same way, every morning, every day throughout the day, we need to decide what to wear. And that's the garment of praise. It's the, it's the decision to walk in the spirit. <clears throat> the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when you are under heaviness, choose to put on praise. When you are depressed, choose to put on praise. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you're in despair, choose to put on praise. When you're dejected or you have inner hurts, hopelessness, or you're hopeless or you're brokenhearted, choose to put on praise. It's, it's a matter of what we will cho choose to do, and God gives us that choice. And God will often bring these things to us, these things of hopelessness, despair, and dejection, because he's getting our attention. And maybe we're not choosing to walk in his will, to walk in his spirit. He wants us to praise him. It has to be our choice. Jonah 2, verses 9 through 10. We, often know, we all know the story of Jonah, likely. It says, but I, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will, pay, I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and he vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. You know, something there got, Jonah's, or got God's attention. And we know a story that uh, Jonah, thank you, Jonah chose to disobey and uh, go the other direction and and God caused a fish to come and swallow him up. And it was that that got, got Jonah's attention. God got Jonah's attention. And we see here in this verse that he decided that he was going to sacrifice a voice of thanksgiving. And he was going to pay that which he vowed. And we know the rest of the story that God caused the fish to vomit Jonah out on the ground. He went and he preached to the Ninevites. And God brought about salvation to Nineveh. And there's more to the story. Jonah went up on the hill and wanted to see the destruction of the Ninevites, and God was teaching him more lessons. But ultimately, this, the point I wanted to point out here was God used this situation, got Jonah's attention, and Jonah realized that he needed to offer the voice of thanksgiving, and God turned it around for good. One more final illustration in, in Psalm, or excuse me, in Acts 16.25, I think I spoke of it already. At the midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So we know here that Paul and Silas put on the garments of praise, and God, uh, again, worked a miracle. And we, we know the story that um, the jail, actually, there was actually an earthquake, if I remember right, and the jailhouse opened up, and uh, they, they were free to go. They were able to get out. And I think as a result, if I remember right, the jailer was saved and his family. So, you know, if we choose to praise, God will work miracles. We'll see it, that illustration that God will use our life. He will use the situation that others can see, and God will be glorified. Psalm 66, 1 through 2. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. If you would, let's stand together and we can uh, close in prayer. And then I have uh, that song. I wanted to sing it. We can, if you're not familiar with it, we can uh, sing it together. 
a couple times. And if I can have Hannah, if you would come and pray, let's, let's, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for uh, your word. Lord, thank you for the help it is to us. And Lord, I, I pray that you would uh, use it tonight. Lord, help us to, to walk with you. Lord, that we wouldn't have to go through trials that, in order for you to get our attention. But Lord, we thank you for the trials. Lord, that we can learn from and grow and, and walk closer with you. Lord, tonight I pray that if there's someone here, Lord, that maybe, Lord, they don't, don't have that salvation. Lord, they don't have the joy. And I, Lord, pray that you just speak to their hearts. Lord, if there's, uh, Lord, someone here that I could share with them the plan of salvation. Lord, I pray that you just open hearts tonight. Lord, I pray that tonight for the Christians here, Lord, for us, that you would just use this in our lives this week. Lord, help us to walk uh, worthy of your name. And Lord, help us to walk in, in your will. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I was able to find the song online, and it's the chords, and Hannah's able to play it, so I appreciate that. The song is called Beauty for Ashes. If you know it, let's sing it out. We'll, we can maybe sing it through a couple times. Um, it's, it comes from uh, the passage in Isaiah there. So.